Hello lovely people, welcome to my non-fiction November wrap-up. I thought that I would do my wrap-up, I would like record it at the end of each week in November so I can summarise like what I've read so far. So as this video goes on you're just gonna like jump through time with me as I read these things. I'm gonna kick things off with the first book that I read for Nonfiction November. This is A Song Flung Up to Heaven by Maya Angelou. I read this for the time prompt. This is uh, another book in Maya Angelou's series of autobiographies. I really love her autobiographies. I think she writes so beautifully. You can tell that she's also a poet. Um, she's had the most fascinating life. I think that she manages to really well, <laughs> that wasn't a sentence, I think she manages very well to capture um, moments of her life, I don't know, there's that thing where you're writing autobiography and you sort of have to impose um, some kind of structure upon your own life because life is often, you know, doesn't necessarily fit into concise little narratives each one of these books sort of has its own um, topics it's exploring and stuff like this. In this she's leaving Ghana to come back to America to work with Malcolm X's organisation um, but this book begins with the assassination of Malcolm X and uh, the fallout there and then it ends with the assassination of Martin Luther King and that's sort of like bookends that um, the rest of the text, as well as focusing on her life and stuff that's happening, it's also really exploring like the ramifications of these things, um, the riots in LA that happened, this sort of thing. And I really feel like she so effectively manages to show you like what's going on in her own personal life. Like she's come back to America, she's trying to find work, she's you know writing her play and stuff like this, and this is all very like personal. Um, and then because she is involved in these moments and she is connected to these moments, she also um, takes you to the wider picture of like, what is going on? What is this civil unrest like? What is um, the contrast between the reaction to Malcolm X's passing and the reaction to Martin Luther King's passing and how um, in some sense, Martin Luther King's passing then caused a lot of people to react differently to Malcolm X's passing than they had initially, stuff like this. It was all really, really interesting. I think she writes absolutely beautifully. I, am, I think I have two books left in this series, and then I'm going to have to start just reading all of her poetry and stuff like this, because I just think she's a wonderful writer, and I thought that this was a marvellous book. Um, after that is a uh, compilation of essays. This is The Book of Queer Prophets, curated by Ruth Hunt. I read this for Discovery because I was going down an angle of discovering one's sexuality or gender identity, um, discovering one's face, stuff like that. I really valued reading this. This is split into um, subsections within. So um, the first section is called Visions, the second Lamentations, Revelations, Vocations, Prayers, and then there's an afterword. Um, I really valued getting these really personal insights into these people's lives. One critique I have of this is that of these 24 writers, um, I felt like there could have been some more variety in religion discussed. So um, these are, um, and I should have been tipped off by the word prophet, because prophet is very much a word that is associated with particular religions and not others. So of these 24 writers, um, one of them is Muslim, one of them is Jewish, one of them is atheist, and then the rest of them are all varying forms of Christianity. So I will say that, like, within these types of Christianity, there are a lot of different branches of Christianity covered. So, you know, like, Anglican, Mormon, like, there's a variety within the Christian setting. It's just that, um, you know, 24 writers and, like, three of them were not some form of Christian. I felt like there could have been more variety and diversity there. That said, um, I don't want to be erasing the other types of diversity that are in this book. You have um, a variety of nationalities, of races, of gender identity, of sexuality. There are a variety of ways in which there is a lot of diversity in this, and I do see that, and I do recognise that. It's just, I think, because, especially because I'm coming into this as someone who is not personally religious, um, I don't know, Christianity just felt like it dominated this a little bit. That said, um, God, there were some really beautiful essays in this. Uh, <laughs> Well, another thing that happens when you read like an essay collection is that obviously some of these works for me better than others. Um, there were a couple that I was like, I perfectly respect the things that you're saying and your life experience, but like this essay just doesn't particularly move me or have as much of an impact as others. Whereas there were others in this that I thought were absolutely beautiful, and I've <laughs> noted down the names of the authors so I can go off and explore them further. But if you're someone who is interested in uh, like personal tales of 
um, both uh, gender identity, sexual identity, um, faith, that sort of stuff. Uh, I do think this is a really good collection. I just had like a tiny niggle, but it was still a four star book for me. It's the end of week two, I have some more books to update you on. First up is Braiding Sweetgrass, Indigenous Wisdom, Scientific Knowledge and the Teaching of Plants by Robin Wall Kimmerer. This was absolutely wonderful, I gave it five stars. Um, Robin Wall Kimmerer is a botanist, so she is coming in with a lot of real scientific knowledge. She's also a member of the Citizen Potawatomi Nation, so she also has a lot of indigenous um, knowledge and so this book is really melding this like scientific understanding of how plants work and this indigenous understanding of how our relationship with the world um, can be and the ways of approaching the world and that sort of thing and then all rounded off by the fact that this writing is so beautiful like there's a real like um, poetry to the way that she phrases things as well so this is a series of essays I should have said so each essay explores different topics different plants but also like different wider topics to do with how we live in relation to the world I just thought that this was absolutely beautiful from head to toe <laughs> I loved everything about this I've been really wanting to expand my nature writing that I read so that it's not just specifically like I've not read a lot of nature writing and most of what I have read has been very like um, white British base I loved getting a glimpse into um, some of the questions that she asked there's an essay really early on that is talking about um, why she wanted to get into botany. There are these two plants that really commonly grow together and they look so beautiful together and she wanted to know why do they look so beautiful together and when she entered this scientific field she was told that's the wrong question to ask, we don't, we're scientists, we don't concern ourselves with beauty but actually there is something to it because the way that these colours um, play out together it's designed to appeal to people so it's designed to appeal to like bees and stuff like this like they they get more um, attention as plants um, from like pollinators and stuff like this if they grow together than if they grow separately um, just like that's just one example of one essay in here there was an I've <laughs> bookmarked some of my favorite bits in here um, I just thought it was absolutely gorgeous especially as well because I don't really know um, a lot of the plants that she's talking about. You know, I've grown up in the UK and I know the particular plants that grow in the UK, but also specifically the particular plants that grow up in like my southwesterly part of England specifically. Um, so I learned a lot about plants that I don't know a lot about and I learned a lot about like ecosystems that I don't really know a lot about. So I just found this absolutely wonderful from start to finish. I really want to read her book on moss because I <laughs> really like moss but I don't know a lot about it, but I'm just really intrigued by moss. So that's definitely going to be a book that I pick up soon, and I cannot wait to read that too. After that, I read Sea People by Christina Thompson, which is In Search of the Ancient Navigators of the Pacific. This is um, a, a history of Polynesia, but specifically sort of like a history of our understanding of Polynesia's history, if that makes sense. So the structure of this was really interesting. Um, we start with um, the first Europeans to go over to Polynesia. Um, we're looking at these like first interactions between um, Polynesian people and the Europeans. We look at Cook um, and we look at like this European understanding of Polynesia. So then we move forward like we follow Cook's journeys but we also then look at like what Polynesian people said about themselves. This documentation we have of um, people writing down Polynesian stories um, and then we move forward again and we look at stuff like one of my favorite chapters in this was about um, experimental voyaging so um, one of the things that keeps recurring in this is because is how exactly did the Polynesian people um, inhabit all of these islands and in what order there are so many islands covered in this Polynesian triangle area but they are um, very far apart at times and how did in what order did people come to be here? Where did they originate from? These are the types of questions that were being dealt with. Um, but one of my favorite sections in this was when they were looking at um, experimental voyagers who um, spoke to indigenous people and looked at how they themselves would navigate um, and then reconstructed the types of vessels that they would go that they would navigate in and then did this journey from Hawaii to Tahiti and then from Tahiti to Hawaii and that was my favorite portion I think because it was so exciting number one just as like a concept of like is it going to work are they going to be able to do it um, but equally like bringing 
I, there is a lot of this because it is to do with colonial history. There are a lot of these theories and stuff that she's presenting to you as this was what people thought at the time. She's not endorsing it as the correct answer. But um, there's a lot of it that's very racist. And there's a lot of it that is very much undermining the intelligence of people and being like, well, they must have just drifted. They can't have navigated their way to these places. And so I particularly enjoyed those experimental voyaging sections because it showed that actually, yes, you can, like, these are intelligent people, they understood how to navigate just because they're doing it in a different way than European sailors knew how to do doesn't mean that they were not able to do these things. And then it brings us up to date with like, what, are, what do we know now? Like, what are the scientific findings we have at the moment? And so this covers a lot more than just the, the voyaging aspect. It also covers stuff like um, looking at like archaeological finds, how we can date those. Um, so it's really, it was an interesting structure. I think I went in expecting it to just like, start in the beginning and be like, in roughly this time, people voyaged from here to here, you know, whereas actually it's like you're on the path with her as she's like taking you through like hundreds of years worth of changing knowledge and changing understanding. And by looking at all the different theories at different times, you can see like scientific progress, you can see progress in our understanding and all that sort of thing. I picked this up because I want to get a better understanding of Polynesian history. This was quite like a broad, like I keep using the word Polynesia rather than specific places within it because it felt like it was covering quite a lot, um, quite broadly. I'd be really interested to um, get any recommendations if anyone has any for books I can read for specific understandings of um, like more localised history to like individual places and stuff like that. That would be really interesting. Um, but yeah, I really enjoyed this. I gave it four stars. I might bump it up to five stars. It's one of those ones that I'm like sitting with. <laughs> After that, it's me. I've already gone rogue on my TBR. Um, I read Confess by Halford, which is Rob Halford, lead singer of Judas Priest's autobiography. Um, this combines two of my favourite things, which is gay memoirs and heavy metal. So um, I actually bought this for my dad for his birthday present and then he lent it to me. I've been getting back into reading like music biographies. Um, this one I really enjoyed because it's got quite a straightforward narrative style. He's also got like some self-awareness and humour going on. Equally, um, you can see that he's walking a line of like um, giving you his life story, but also not oversharing things that people might not appreciate being shared. I like respected the honesty because, um, you know, I think in all autobiographies there will be a certain amount that goes unsaid and I kind of appreciated the like tacit acknowledgement that he's like, I'm telling you my story but I'm not telling you like other people's stories. Um, but this was really lovely. I had a really great time reading this. I have grown up listening to Judas Priest, as is the way with stuff that I've, like, grown up with as a child. You know, you don't always, like, know the stuff behind it. Like, I know the music. I don't know a huge amount of the, what went into making the album. So I really enjoyed the insights into, like, the creative process that he has with his uh, songwriting and then also like the background behind some of the albums. He is a man who has had his own struggles and his own demons and he's very honest and forthright about that and I really respected the candor with which he spoke about these things. It brings me such great joy to um, that he is now living his life as like a very out gay man but also like the metal god that he is. Um, you know there's a lot of I can't imagine the pressure that came with um, having this immensely successful band and being absolutely terrified that if he's honest about who he is then it will crumble and fall away. Like he's very, again, he's very honest about what that experience was like for him in this. I thoroughly enjoyed that and I'd really recommend it for, specifically if you're a metal fan, if you're a Judas Priest fan, I think there's a lot to be gained from it. Um, I gather that K.K. Downing's um, autobiography was slightly less generous than Halford has been in his, um, so that's one to read at some point I'm sure, but um, yeah I thoroughly enjoyed that. After that I wrote another book that was lent to me by someone else. This is The Dignity of Difference, How to Avoid the Clash of Civilizations by Jonathan Sachs. I don't know a lot about Rabbi Sachs, but I do know that he passed away this month. So um, because this had been lent to me, I was like, it, it feels like a terrible thing to be like, oh, he died and then I read his book, but you know, people get put into your consciousness. And then, so I kind of wanted to read it as just like a, okay, I understand that this man is very important to a lot of people. I don't really know anything about him. I'll read his book. Um, he's an orthodox rabbi. This book is kind of like essentially arguing that difference is something that enriches us and makes us better as people. He's kind of like reaching out across faiths to sort of argue that 
um, this concept of difference as being bad and that it's specifically in a religious concept that like only people who share your religion are good is inherently flawed. I don't necessarily agree with everything that he's arguing in this. I did agree with a lot of stuff that he said. I thought that um, some of his critiques of how contemporary society is going, oh god, <laughs> there's like this moment, because this was written um, I think early 2000s, there's like this moment where he posits two possible 2020s and one of them is like, we have worked together to tackle climate change, the most vulnerable are being looked at, it's like this golden glowing thing, and then like the bad future was like, there's increasing climate d disasters, um, terror attacks are on the rise, blah, blah blah and I was like, we are living in the bad 2020, <laughs> which was great to become aware of how clearly he foresaw this happening. Um, but yes, I gave this three out of five stars largely because although I think that there is a lot of um, really good points being made at the heart of this, I just think that where I personally struggled is that this is obviously being um, shown to you in an explicit way that is based around Judaism and it is um, it's not just arguing for this like uh, difference as enriching type thing, but it's specifically like talking about it in terms of um, using passages from the Hebrew Bible and stuff like this. Like it's posited within this religious context. And just personally, as someone who's not religious and I haven't been brought up very religious, so um, just a lot of that wasn't the type of language and arguing that I'm very familiar with. So it was more just as I was reading it, I had a slight disconnect personally because I was like, this is not a, a framework within I within which I operate. Therefore, like I just struggled to really connect with a lot of it because I was like on board with this message at the heart, which is that like difference enriches us. There is so much to be gained from embracing our differences. Um, it's just the language through which it was done was just not one that I hugely relate to. After that I read Dead Famous by Greg Jenner on my Kindle. Dead Famous is sort of a history of celebrity. Um, this was slightly different from how I expected it to be but I still had a really fun time, that's not a criticism. I think I expected this to be like each chapter would look at different celebrity from history and then would sort of like discuss them. Whereas really all the different chapters are discussing different elements of the concept of celebrity, which was very interesting. Like for example, there's a chapter which is looking at like words that you might automatically link with celebrity, like fame, like notoriety, stuff like this. Um, what is the difference between those and celebrity and, you know, like pinning down where does celebrity originate? Like one of his main arguments is, is that you don't have celebrity before you have the printing press because an aspect of celebrity is not just being famous and renowned and well known and those types of things. There's like a specific aspect which is to do with like people avidly following not just your career but your personal life and stuff like this and these slight types of things that are only really developed post printing press type thing. Um, that's just an example. Um, all of the different chapters in this explore a variety of different concepts associated with celebrity and that was really interesting. I definitely feel like it's given me a lot to consider specifically in regards to like differences between like run people who are renowned and people who you would class as a celebrity like one of his examples is David Attenborough um you'd say that he's famous and he's well known for his knowledge but we don't sit there and be like his paparazzi shots of him on his holiday you know like he's not like a necessarily a celebrity he is a famous person you know if it's a three stars I might bump it up to a four stars I'm sort of on that cusp between the two and I don't know which one to go down. One of the things that is making me unsure of my rating is that we're not going through in like a timeline order, we're having like these concepts and in the concepts we're exploring a whole bunch of different people within them. There are some people who crop up quite a lot and occasionally there was like a little bit of rep repetition of things because I was like, oh this person, again. Whereas there are other people who are briefly mentioned and I'm like, I would love to know more about this person and I understand that like essentially probably in the editing process it's like okay you can't just like tell me about all of these fascinating people I understand that um but just that sort of like um mix of occasionally a little bit too much versus occasionally not enough just like made me made me question which which ratings to do um there's a lot of humor in this he is a historical consultant for horrible histories and if you like horrible histories this is very much sort of like an adult version of that insofar as there's still a lot of humor there's still a lot of puns he's like in many ways talking like directly to you at times he's like i blah 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 um 
and I think partly as well that depth of knowledge thing really made me feel like occasionally I was reading like a an elongated horrible histories book at times because it was like here's anecdote and I'm like I want to hear more about the person involved in anecdote and it's like you know it's not always possible to do that because you're <laughs> on a word count limit and all that jazz um, so suffice to say, I thought it was really fun, I had a really fun time reading it, it was very interesting, it's given me a lot to consider. Um, I would really recommend it if you're someone who loved horrible histories, um, or is very interested in this concept of celebrity. It's not a topic that I feel like I don't pay a lot of attention to celebrities, I think. But then, like, some of the ways he was talking about how we use celebrity as, like, um, to define ourselves sometimes, or to um, help in, like, social relationships and stuff like this, it was very, very interesting. It's the end of week three, and I have two more books to talk about. The first book I want to talk about is The Ways of My Grandmothers by Beverly Hungry Wolf. Beverly Hungry Wolf is from the Blackfoot Nation. Specifically, she and most of the people she's talking to in this are blood. Um, this was such a wonderful, like, capturing of a moment thing. She sort of set out to capture, like, um, the history and experiences of her grandmothers while she still could. Um, so the first section of this, she's talking to a lot of the older women who have been um, really influential on her and have taught her a lot and that sort of thing. So the first section is, it's kind of like direct um, transcription of conversations she's having with these women. And I really loved that element of it because each woman has their own specific way of telling stories and recounting um, history and stuff like this. So you really got like, um, like a range of voices in this and I really enjoyed that. There are sections in this that are black and white photos which were also really fabulous. It's lovely to put faces to these women's names as a start point. I'm very much coming in as an outsider, obviously, so for me it was really wonderful to get, like, visual images of some of the things they're talking about, whether that's in regards to, like, clothing or um, preparing hides, stuff like this. So that was just really um, lovely from my perspective, especially because I'm quite a visual person, so I find it really helpful to be able to see things. Um, and then there's also um, parts of this which are Beverly herself, um, just writing things down and explaining things. Um, this covers a broad range of topics, so it covers um, just telling you about um, people just telling you about their lives, people telling you about um, notable women, people telling you about um, some foundational stories that explain how things came to be in the world, also just like a detailed breakdown, like for example, what do Blackfoot people eat? What is like traditional food that they would prepare? How would they go about making the food, hunting the food, that sort of thing? She says in the beginning, I'm not writing this book because I think I'm an expert at my native ancestry and culture, nor because I expect to make much money from it. I do it in an effort to fill a space in history that has been empty for too long. Today's world is so crowded that we often turn to books in order to experience what life was like in other times and other cultures, but there are no such books about my Indian grandmothers of the Blackfoot Nation, including my division, the Bloods. There are books that tell about horse stealing, buffalo hunting, and war raiding, but the reader would have to assume that Indian women lived boring lives of drudgery, and that their minds were empty of stories and anecdotes. I hope that this book provides some inspiration and guidance to the young girls who are growing up behind me. I hope also that it enlightens many other book readers by showing that Indian women have knowledge to contribute to world history. I wish more people would share the ways of their grandmothers. I think it would help the present world situation if we all learned to value and respect the ways of the grandmothers, our own as well as everyone else's. And I just feel like she really achieved that really well. Um, I thought that this was very interesting and I really enjoyed the reading process of it. I also downloaded Libby for the first time. I've been powerfully missing my library. I am very lucky that I have a generous TBR pile. Um, I'm kind of not really buying many more books because uh, 2020 has not been the best financial year for many of us. And I miss my library. I miss it deeply. So I downloaded Libby. The first book I tried out was uh, Work Like a Woman, A Manifesto for Change by Mary Porters. I, pick, I decided to read this because um, my friend had recommended it to me and I saw it was available on there and I thought it's quite short, I'll give it a go my first time using Libby. It was interesting, I think the my main stumbling block with it is that word like manifesto because when I hear the word manifesto I'm expecting like a text that's really like laying out for me sort of like um, identifying problems like here are solutions this is like what they're pushing for. I'm not saying there weren't elements of that. 
largely a lot of this was sort of like a bio like an autobiography of Mary Portis and her own experiences which makes sense because she is illustrating through her professional career things she has observed and things that she does differently now so that does make sense it's just for a very short book there was a lot of it which was a potted autobiography which was interesting because Mary Portis has had an interesting career and she has had um, a lot of her personal life things have influenced the way that she now structures her company um, so that was interesting and it was interesting to get this like potted history like how did she get where she was the book is looking at stuff like pay disparity and then also just like the ways in which workplaces are often built to prioritize um, men's way of working and that can be in like overtly obvious discriminatory ways but then also just like the way in which how a lot of companies function is not set to work for women in the long term there was a lot of interesting information in it it didn't feel hugely groundbreaking or rather like it's kind of I didn't see how a lot of the stuff she's talking about could be like transcribed onto my particular workplace and that's because we work in different industries and in different like levels and stuff like this I don't know um, my friend found it very useful because she works very much in like a creative field and um, has had um, kind of similar experiences to some of the stuff that Mary Porters was talking about and so she found this way of going about things differently like very helpful in her own personal life it's just I work in a completely different field and it's structured differently and stuff like that um it was a solid three star book for me final week update for you I'm very sorry if it's very dark it feels like a gloomy day today I have three more books to talk about and then we are done we have summed up the month of reading so I'm going to kick things off with The World Turned Upside Down by Christopher Hill, Radical Ideas During the English Revolution. This, I have been to, it has taken me a while. It took some time, but I actually really enjoyed it and I had a lot of thoughts on it. It's made me think about a lot of things. This is focused on the English Revolution. So when England was like a republic and we chucked Charles I off the throne and Parliament um, ran the ship, if you will, this was very interesting. Um, it took me a little chapter or two to get into it just because the style is such. Um, first of all, he's not giving you a history of this period of time. So I did come in with some knowledge of like the English Revolution. I have my basic bare bones. I know who's involved and I know some of the radical ideas that are being talked about. So for example, we're talking about like levelers, ranters, Quakers, these sorts of movements. Um, he's not giving you a history of the time period, he's really tracing the development of these ideas and um, looking at specific like topics and ideas to do with them. So occasionally, upon immediately settling into the book, um, the style is not the necessarily the style that I find the easiest to read of non-fiction. Um, contrast that though, my partner who um, lent this to me and who has a lot of knowledge of like 17th century England um, read this in two days. It took me like a week and a half, so <laughs> you know, different tastes. So this is specifically kind of looking at around 1640 and 1650 as these like pivotal point of time whereby in order to build the new model army and essentially have enough troops to overthrow Charles the first side of things um, they had to sort of mobilize the common people um, and so it's this real like rise of Protestantism and um, they gave a lot of empowerment or, or, or not necessarily empowerment but a lot of rhetoric was um, aimed at your common man and then it meant that post-revolution when Charles I is off the throne and you've got Parliament ruling it um, there was a lot of these really radical ideas and these radical ways of thinking that really came into prominence specifically in around 1640 to 1650 um, and then after that point they sort of settled a bit I think I had expected this to sort of be split into the different ideas that he's looking at so like a chapter on diggers a chapter on levelers a chapter on ranters but that doesn't really make sense now that I have read this and and understand what he's doing because these are not movements that you can really sift out and separate because they're not it's not like someone was like right lads let's make a group called the ranters and we're all going to do this it's not like these are like separate cohesive things like different movements inform other movements and someone might start off as like a true leveler and then they end up a quaker at the end of it or stuff like this so it's that wouldn't have made sense i now realize and that's not what this does 
it's more like a word of warning that I would say read this if you're someone who already has like an interest and a background in this particular time period and you want to look at more the evolution and development of these radical ways of thinking and you want to understand those better rather than as your start point to introduce you to these things you know because the chapters I enjoyed the most were definitely the ones where I had a little bit more of a background on who the groups were <laughs> some of them I was like I don't know who these people are and I was a little bit confused but I had some really interesting um made me think about a lot of stuff essentially like one of the things that my partner pointed out he was like everyone looks at like the counterculture free love movement in the 60s 1960s and thinks it's really radical and new but you have people here in like the 1640s and 1650s who are going around naked they're going around proposing like free love and stuff like this so it was really interesting to see these like roots of this thing some of these things which we think of as very modern it was also very intriguing because like it was such a battle to get the bible translated to english so that like every man could read the bible and do his own personal like understanding of it which is like pretty key to like protestantism and then you have some people in this who are like we read the bible too much it's just a book we need to like look inwards on ourselves and stuff like this so it took such a long amount of time to get the bible accessible to like every person who could read um and then <laughs> to just be like i think we should just throw it out the window um, there were also, I really enjoyed the chapter that was sort of looking at ideas of sin. What happens when you make a text accessible to a large portion of people is that all of those people will have different interpretations of the text. And so, like, sin became a whole thing. Um, if purgatory doesn't exist, what does that mean for, the per for like, human souls? And um, are there people who are um, inherently predestined to end up in heaven and be good and people who are predestined to end up in hell? Um, and does that concept re mainly just reinforce hierarchies that exist in the world? Like, it's, of course, the rich elite who are destined to go to heaven and the poor who are destined to go to hell and questioning these things. I don't know. As someone who... I realise that I've talked about a number of, like, religious-based books this month. It's not intentional. I don't feel like I have a very confident grounding in religion. So it's been interesting to read a number of different texts which deal with different religions in different ways. This one has just opened my eyes a bit more to like, so Protestantism, what part of it, you know? So like re radically rethinking ideas about humans' relations to the divine. Like, is God real? There was like this idea that like God was like this dude, he was like six foot tall, and it's like there was all these people being like, God is like a, is not a physical thing god is blah and like that was really controversial so it's been very interesting so as well as the section that was particularly focused on like sin and hell and stuff like that that i found very intriguing how do you rethink and rework these huge concepts um i also really enjoyed the chapter that was on like um magic because um you know like magic astronomy and stuff like this which we would think of as being very separate from religion actually all the ways in which they're like intertwined at this point of time essentially this is one of those texts where it's like initially i was like oh god what have i got myself into i don't really understand what's going on and then i settled and i've actually had a lot of really interesting like mulling over discussions with my partner that sort of thing definitely one to read with a grounding of base knowledge like literally at one point when he started talking about the levelers he was like there's been so many histories of the levelers i'm not going to give you one and i was like could you just give me like two sentences <laughs> because I was like, I know what they are, kind of, but also, hmm. It was very interesting tracing of developments of radical ideas. My final thing I will say before I shut up and talk about the other books is I find it extremely interesting that these movements that are inherently based in nonconformity, at some point, if they want to become a cohesive whole, they then have to try and implement conformity upon nonconformity. This was particularly relevant in regards to Quakers, because this is this movement that that um, arose out of nonconformity and um, some of the radical things they did were preserved, like not taking their hats off, not swearing oaths, um, stuff like that, but then some of their more extreme things by the end of this like 20 year period were not really what they were doing anymore. They sort of had become this cohesive whole and this movement and just the act of imposing conformity upon something that by its very nature is nonconformist was like 
super duper interesting. So, it took me a while to warm up, but as you might be able to tell, she's got a lot of thoughts. If anyone <laughs> watching this is super into <laughs> radical ideas of the 17th century, do let me know, we can have a chat in the comments down below. After that, I read a book. That's a stupid thing to say. Of course I did. That's what this whole bloody video is on. Oh, after that I read a book on Libby. I read Home Cooking by Laurie Colwyn. She also wrote other books, but these are her food writings. So she's not known for being a chef, but this is just like a collection of essays and recipes upon food. Every chapter is sort of like looking at a different food, looking at a different topic, usually interspersed with her writings. There are recipes themselves. It was a perfectly fun read. It was very, um, light-hearted, it didn't take itself too seriously, you can really tell that she loves food, um, she's done a lot of like trial and error because she's very much like a home cook rather than like a professional chef. Um, occasionally, personally, I won't be making any of the recipes from this, um, I'm vegetarian, she had like one vegetarian recipe that she was like, I serve this to my vegetarian friends, and it was literally like steamed vegetables with a dipping sauce, and I was like, are you shitting me, Laurie? She has the most wonderfully sounding meat-based recipes in this book, and I was like, a plate of steamed vegetables. But I understand, she's coming from like a 60s, 70s cooking kind of background. Um, so like, you know, it's not the end of the world. I didn't read this to get recipes. I was just like, girl, do you think this is good? your vegetarian friends. Sometimes her humour was not always my kind of humour, sometimes her humour was a little bit harsh for me, specifically in regards to like some people's like dietary needs and stuff like this. Um, she seems to view it a little bit as like a tiny bit of a fad and I was just like, hmm, let's not do that. Um, but it was perfectly fun and lovely, it was very light-hearted, I sort of dipped into it um, kind of in the advert breaks while I was watching things on the television, and it was very easy to like dip in and out. So it was a fun piece of food writing, it's definitely not my favourite piece of food writing that I've ever read, but I did enjoy it. The final book that I read for Nonfiction November was The Beautiful Ones by Prince and Dan Peepenbring. So this is what Prince was working on just before he passed away, and that leads it to the kind of the crux of, of the problem with this book, if you will. This was intended to be um, Prince's autobiography, but obviously, because he passed away very unexpectedly, that is not what this is, because they didn't have they didn't have the time to do that. Dan opens the book with writing about his experience of being taken on to write this book, the meetings he had with Prince, the interactions they had, the visions that Prince had for this book, because he had so many um, concepts of what this could be, and um, could it be a straight autobiography, could it be kind of like a manifesto, that sort of thing. So there were a lot of really interesting um, moments within that portion of the narrative where you're sort of getting an insight into what Prince envisaged this to be, how his mind worked when he was thinking about it and stuff like that, and that was really interesting. Um, there's also a segment that is what Prince actually did write himself, so when they were working on the concept for this book he wrote down sort of um, some memories from his early life, like where he envisaged starting this narrative, and those are transcribed for you. Um, a tiny note if you are, for example, dyslexic, stuff like that, the sections that are written by Prince, um, as you might know from his uh, <laughs> song titles, instead of saying you, he does the letter U, instead of saying two, he does a two, instead of saying I, it's a picture of an I. So that might be a little bit hard from a reading per point of view, depending on how you are with stuff like that. And then you reach a point and it's sort of like a collection of mixed media. So there's um, the original outline that he wrote for the Purple Rain film is in here. There's like um, scans of like some photo albums he had. And then at the back there are notes telling you like who these people are, like what the background is, stuff like that. And it's sort of like a collection of stuff that they found in Prince's vault that had sort of seemingly be intended to be used in this. Um, so for what it is, I enjoyed reading this, I love Prince's music, I think he was an absolutely incredible creator, the versatility, the range, the sheer amount of stuff he created, amazing. 
The sadness at the heart of this is that this is incomplete and it very much doesn't really feel like a complete book. It feels like they've pieced together what they had. Um, which is fine because I bought this for my partner second hand. Um, full price, this is quite an expensive book and I think if I had paid full price for this book I might be a bit disappointed by what it is. Um, but I enjoyed reading it, I enjoyed the insight. The problem is is that when I read music biographies like the Halford one mentioned earlier in this video, I like to come away feeling like I know the artist better and I've had some kind of insight into them and this didn't entirely allow for that because it wasn't possible, because he wasn't around. So you know, I fully understand why it is what it is, but it is also a bit sad that it is not what it could have been. Um, I'm going to, on that note, bring this mammoth of a video to a close. I would love to know if you have read any of these, if you have thoughts on any of them, please do leave a comment down below. I would love to hear it. I would also very much enjoy hearing what you yourself have read for Nonfiction November. Do you have any highlights? That sort of thing. Otherwise, I will stop talking now, and I will see you next time for something different. I hope you have a lovely day in the meantime.